Yo, what's up everybody? How you doing? This is your coach Renz and by the time this video is posted, it'll be after the election. So whoever won, they won and it is what it is now. But well, as we get started, I want to first thank everybody who subscribes to the channel, everybody who's a patron. Thank you very much. Everybody who shops at Uncle Ren's Popcorn. Thank you very much. Now, this video is actually in response to a TikTok that I did on my Coach Ren 369 uh, page uh, in TikTok on TikTok. So if you're not if you're on TikTok, go and follow me there as well, because I do meditation moments on that video on that channel. But I did a one minute meditation moment moment the other day. And before I actually talk about it and about some of the comments about it, I want you guys to go ahead and check it out. So, meditation moment. I've had my business flourish during Obama. And I've had my business do horrible during Obama. I've had my business do horrible under Trump. And I've had my business currently flourishing under Trump. What's the common denominator? Some people are going to say the economy this and the economy that. But at the end of the day, I picked locations that were great under Obama, and at the same time, I picked locations that were horrible under Obama. I picked locations that were horrible under Trump, and I picked locations that were amazing under Trump. So again, what's the common denominator? Okay, so as you see on that video, I'm talking about the fact that depending up, regardless of who was president, regardless of who was whose administration was going on, I had business success and I had business uh, failures. I had business lessons. I like to call business lessons failures. Uh, business failures as lessons because they spring me forward and I learn from them, which is what you should be doing as well. And the most of the comments in there, both from black people and white people, Republicans and Democrats, were very supportive. You know, you learn about, lo they were talking about location, they were talking about, I'm the, I'm the common denominator. Uh, the econ you know, different things, the economy, moving forward. There was a few people who had negative things to say. A few people took it as an opportunity to talk about Joe Biden's tax program or Trump's tax program. A few people took it as an opportunity to be pro-Trump and pro-Biden. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Those are not the ones that I'm most concerned with. The ones that I was the most concerned with, the ones that bothered me the most, it, it were, were particularly two people who made comments that I have experienced as one of the plagues that we face as black people. We have to recognize as black people that we are the oppressed minority within America, that more people look at us as a scourge of society than they do look at looking at us as a promise of society. But what we have to do within our own culture is to recognize that we see ourselves as a promise of society, a greatness in society, a, an up and coming force in society, a society of can do and will do uh, personalities and people. We have to see ourselves that way. And what we must not do is allow religion to be a focal point when we're talking about business to deter black people from doing business, regardless of the political landscape. You see, I find that many of my African-American brothers whose family has been here four, five, six, 10, 15, 20 generations have scapegoated the vote in place of them doing the work that they need to do in order to become successful. We know that America does not respect an economically um, deprived or economically lower uh, social class that is not respected, that the politicians don't respect you if you're not putting money in their pocket, if you're not the voting block that actually gets them into office. We, we have to recognize that black people are needed by the Republican Party by about five or 10 percent, whereas Democrats need about 27, 25 percent of the black vote. We, we don't recognize that. And I, and I may have those numbers wrong. It may be the Republicans need 25 percent and then they can... That, that nullifies the remaining black vote. It's some kind of thing like that. I don't know if somebody tell me in the comments. Um, but when I used to be very political, I knew those things. But, but we have to recognize that this, this is a game of monopoly here. 
This is the game of the Monopoly. And for the people who are white and you're listening to this, you need to understand this. Now, I do appreciate how there were black people and white people in very much in support of that video. But recognize this for some of the white people who thinks that the playing field is equal, that it's a, it's a fair playing field. And for the black people who are listening, I need you to understand that it's not an equal playing field. So stop thinking that the vote is going to be your equalizer because the vote is not your equalizer. You got to know this. You got to know that the people you're putting in office aren't there for you. They only care about you every four years or every mid-election. So recognize we are playing Monopoly. Right. Imagine we're playing Monopoly as racial groups, but white people imagine that black people haven't been allowed to play a round of Monopoly for over 400 years. For the first 400 years of Monopoly in America, black people weren't allowed to take a turn. So while you were buying, getting the property and building your houses and building your hotels and getting the railroads and the utility companies, while you were doing that, the black people were, um, they were, they, we were sitting at on the board of Monopoly, but we were the free labor. And we, we didn't get to play around and pass go and collect $200 because every time we got to go, you know, you, you took the $200. Every time we landed on boardwalk, you took the $500. You took whatever effort was put in by black people for the first 400 years. And then after the Civil War had ended, you, you then said you can play, but every time you build something, we're going to take it. We said, okay, you pass go. You got $200. You bought this property right here. But what we're going to do is set up Freeman Bank and you put your $200 in the Freeman Bank so we can help you to buy even more property. But instead, you take the $200, you take whatever we had, we, whatever was accomplished, and you loan it out to the former slave masters, you loan it out to the children of the former of the former slave masters. You loan it loan it out to the union uh, um, um, companies, the union soldiers. You loan it out to the northerners who were building the infrastructure of America. You loan it and give it to them, and expect us to still be playing equally in the game. But you're taking, and if we grew, if we did grow a proper a property, if we did get a property and we start growing it. Then you came in and you took it. You burned it down like Rosewood. You burned it down like Tulsa. You you came into our communities like in Wilmington, North Carolina, and you burned it down and you took it. And you came into Lake Lanier here in Georgia and you flooded out the black people so that you can give lakefront property to the white people. You, you took for the next 50 years that you, you, you stymied us from being able to understand and read the rules and follow the rules you change the rules based on how our development was going so for the next 50 years you did that and then after the 50 years you you gave us tidbits you gave us crumbs it it reminds me of how stalin ripped all the the story of stalin ripping all the feathers from the chicken and then it's the, as the chicken lay there as a bloody mess and he gave it crumbs that chicken just followed him around and in the in the 50s and 60s, it was Republicans that blacks followed them around as they said, we're going to get you the right to vote. We're going to uh, we're going to be there for the bus, bus boycotts. We're coming in for voter registration and black people followed your Republicans around. And then it switched hands with the Democrats in the in the 70s and black people just followed around again and again and again. And, and black people, we have to realize that we were that bloody chicken that's just following around a Republican or a Democrat just for the crumbs that they keep giving us. And we have to recognize that we're not playing monopoly equally to those who brought the game over, who took the game, who stole the game, who had the game. And that the ancestors of those people, now those ancestors, those white ancestors are saying that, well, we, were, we weren't the ones who held the slaves. We weren't the ones who were doing Jim Crow, but here, you're benefiting from it. You are still the beneficiaries of it and you're still maintaining it. So therefore you are still part of the issue here. But also black people, we have an issue as well. One is that we're still playing this game the way they're playing it, the way they set it up, still not making our own rules 
for the game. We're still not grabbing the rules, holding the rules, and forcing them to be able to play by their own rules so that we can grow. And more importantly, we're not saying you're playing Monopoly here at this table, but there's another table over here, and I'm going to start a series uh, next week of countries in Africa where we can go play Monopoly on a brand new table, in a brand new house, in a place where the rules haven't been set against us, in a place where we can play equally and have a fair opportunity to be able to build our boardwalk, to be able to build what you know our reading railroads, to be able to build our utilities. We're gonna play it at a different table. We don't need your table to play it. We don't have to have your table to play it. But if we are gonna play at your table, you're gonna abide by those rules. So, but spiritually, we can't kill each other financially because of our spiritual upbringing, because of the spiritual uh, thought process that we had, thought process that we have. And that's, that's what bothered me the most. It wasn't some of the black people who said that, you know, who, who talked about voting for Biden or Trump's a racist and that sort of thing. That, that didn't bother me as much because during this political environment, people will side with whomever they decide to side with. I really don't care. Do, do, do you vote how you vote. However you vote is how you vote. None of my business. None of my business. I know what I do. You know what you do. Don't ask me who I voted for because I'm not going to tell you. It's none of your business. But the thing about it is the, the first person was, you know, without even knowing, just, just listening to the video itself, the first person said uh, something to the effect of uh, what does a gain, what, do, what does a gain, a man, what, what is it that a man that gains the whole world that, but loses his own soul? He, he assumed, he, he took his political leanings and, and, and assumed my political leanings and assumed who I am as far as my soul is concerned. And I replied to him to the effect that you don't know me. You can't judge me. And I told him that you are demonstrating a poverty of mind, a poverty of spirit, and a poverty of soul within yourself in the fact that you make the assumption, the leap, that because I said that the common denominator in my business flourishing or not is me. It's how I move. It's how I recognize the Obama taxation plan, how I'm going to use that effectively. The Trump taxation plan, how I'm going to use that effectively. And if Joe Biden won the election and his tax plan goes into the process, how am I going to use that effectively? How am I going to use the movements of the economy effectively? How am I going to use marketing effectively? He took that, he took me saying that to the idea that I have lost my soul in place of wealth. And what I'm saying is that if you are following this spirituality of Christianity more than likely, because of what he quoted, I'm, I'm going to take the leap of saying, and it's not a big leap, that he's supporting Christianity. And this is not just for him, because the other person, she started talking about how, you know, that's good for me, but everybody can't be on top. And, and at first I looked to help her out. And I said, well, everybody can be on top because everybody top is different. You see, yours might be a million dollars and the other person might be $50,000 or $100,000. Each have the ability to reach that goal. And if you reach that goal, you reach that lifestyle that you have desired for yourself and your family, then you are on top. If your goal is a vacation every quarter and you are able to do it, you've reached the top. If your goal is a vacation every year and you're able to do it, you've reached the top. If the goal is to, just, is to buy a house in the country or to buy a condo, in the city and you accomplish it then you've reached the top you see everybody can reach the top it's just we have to get out of the mindset that the top is exactly the same because it's not the top is whatever you decide it to be and but yet she was still arguing that you know everybody can't be rich and I'd rather be happy and, and this sort of thing and I was like well and, and if you're rich you're some kind of evil and she quoted something about being rich but stuck standing on the backs and necks of other people and I was like and giving to the poor that if you're rich people are evil because they don't give to the poor and I had to remind her that first of all
of all, if you if you don't have a fish, then you can't feed somebody some fish. Even Yeshua in the story had to have a two-piece fish sandwich before he can feed the people to multiply it. So you still got to first get you a, a fish if you want to feed somebody. And if you think about it, the majority of charities in this world are funded by the wealthy. They're not funded by the average person. They're funded by the wealthy. And yes, they get tax benefits for doing so. And yet, we here's the funny part. Wealthy person finances a charity. Oh, they just doing it for the tax benefit. It's not in their heart. They're evil. Poor person gives to the same charity or middle class person. They're doing it from their heart. Who are you to judge the heart of anyone's giving of charity? Do you not if that charity is deductible on your taxes, would you not take it as well? Think about that. You're itemizing your taxes. You get to charitable deduction. Do you put your 10% that you give to your church? Do you put your 5% that you gave to the building fund? Do you put your 5% that you gave to whatever other charities you desire to give to? So do you claim your full 20% of, of charities? that you give your money to, your clothing donations that you give, do you claim all of those? And if your itemized deduction is higher than your standard deduction, would you not take that itemized deduction that has your charities in it? Of course you would, of course you would. But yet you gave from the heart and they gave because just only the tax deduction, not because they really care. If that was the case, most of the charities that exist wouldn't even exist. Because most of these charities are not funded by the average person. They're funded by people who make over six, who make six figures and above. Those are the people who are funding it. The 10% are funding the majority of charities in this world. That's just the simple, that's just the facts of it. But these people have this mindset that if becoming wealthy is something evil that we must uh, not fight for. But if they actually read their own book, they would understand that Ecclesiastes tell them that they should do many businesses because you don't know which one will succeed. It tells them that they're supposed to be lenders, not borrowers. It gives you the story of the talents. And I've only heard about three ministers who actually center on one portion of it or talks a lot about one portion of that story. You see in that story, for those who may not know, you had three servants. And the master is going to go away. And the master gives one servant, you know, five bags of gold. He gives another servant three bags of gold and gives another servant one bag of gold. Because the master understands the mentality of his servants, he gives the unequal amounts. The servant who gave five bags of gold, they turns that he flips that into ten bags of gold. The one that he gave three bags of gold, he flips it into two bags of gold. And the one they gave one bag of gold, he hid it in the earth because he was scared of his master and wanted to make sure he gave it back to him. Master returns, he looks at it, all three servants said, report, what have you done? The one that had five said, hey, I took it, I went out, I invested, I turned it into 10. Good job. The one who did the three, he said, hey, I went out there, it was a little rough, I was a little scared, but I flipped it, I turned it into five. He said, good job. The one that had the one, he said, hey, look, I, I know you a hard dude and everything. I buried it so that make sure that when you came back, I can give you your one bag go. He said, oh, really? You sorry joker. You could have at least put it in the bank so I could have earned some interest on it. But he, so he got pissed off and he beat that joker down. Now, here's the part. And then most pastors, they stop right there and say, too much is given, much is expected, that you got to go out, you got to use your talents, blah, 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 blah. But one part that they always, that most pastors never really talk about, and maybe you've heard somebody talk about it, is the fact that he took the one bag from the one that he beat and said, I'm going to give it to the one that turned the five into ten, the one that had the easier time, the one that was more confident in what he was doing, the one that showed he has a greater ability to increase my goal. And then it talks about how what the what those who have the least it will be taken from them and given to those who are, who have the most and that they will be rewarded for having the most people they'll work i'm telling you even right now there are some people who are going to figure out how i'm misrepresenting that piece of scripture and i don't understand it and i don't know it and because i don't have this relationship with god they have because they i don't follow their teaching that I don't really understand it, but I've studied this thing forwards and backwards, inside, outside, left, right, esoterically, literally, any other way you want to study this, that I've come to know and understand that that part is not really hard to understand. It's literally saying that those who are capable, those who 
learn, those who figure out how to do more, do better with what is given to them, will be a will be will receive more, and they will be able to get from those who don't do nothing with it. And is that is that not even if it's it's cultural? If you look at the culture of the time frame when these things was written, is that not how things have been and always will be? That those who have the ability, have the knowledge, have the will to go out there and make more, to turn something, turn nothing into something, or turn whatever they opportunity they have into something, that those are the ones who will continue to get. It's just like when I have people say, well, I want to start a women's shelter. And I asked them, I said, well, what business do you have right now that can fund your women's shelter? And they said, no, no, I just want to go get grants. And then I explained to them that, well, here's how the government works most of the time, and most grant agencies work. If an organization comes up who already has a women's shelter to have one, two, three, four, and they see that they already know how to manage one, those organizations are going to get the grants before you do because they've already demonstrated that they know how to utilize that money to open up a women's shelter. You've demonstrated nothing, but you want them to take a risk on you being able to do it. It's less likely, not that it's impossible, but it's less likely. If I'm competing against, if I got to look at you and I got to look at somebody who's already done it, I'm going to give that money to somebody who's already done it. So you got to go out there and prove yourself. You got to show and prove that you know what you're doing, but most people don't. So what I'm saying is that for those people who want to use their spirituality to say that I am wrong and evil and that I'm worshiping money instead of God or whatever. Yes, I don't worship nothing. I don't, I, nothing. I, don't, I worship no one or nothing. I respect and I honor the creator. And by honoring the creator, I utilize the laws that the creator put in place and I go forward and I go hard at utilizing those laws because that is my divinity. My divinity is to say that something was shown to me, something was given to me. The laws of the universe, the law of cause and effect was shown to me, given to me. I've learned from that. And because the creator set that law into motion and just said, have at it, do what you will with it. I'm not geppettoing you. Then I go forward and I use that law. That And because I do, the power, the, the power that is within it comes to me and I utilize it. And I am now better for it. And I'm telling you that if you don't get out there and utilize what's been given to you and make it and double it and triple it and quadruple it, you will see that more of it will come to you. You like to call it serendipity. You like to call it energy, flow, vibration. It is Call it whatever you will, but that's what it is. And the more you do that, the more you will have. And there will be those who will look down on you. And you have to say to yourself, so the hell, what if they do? That's their problem, not mine. Because you can't allow yourself to be dimmed down by somebody else. Allow your light to shine no matter who else lights is trying to shine around you or who try to bring shadow or shade against you. Because they cannot stop you unless you let them. So to those people who find a problem with the fact of what I said, then that's your problem, not mine. And you got to always remember, it is your greatness. It is not theirs that you must be concerned with. Because people will try to cut you down and don't allow them to. Because you have to realize you got to free yourself to be yourself. Because your greatness is non-negotiable. So good vibrations, good journey. Look forward to more and more of these videos and more lives. Y'all have a great day. Have a great day.